On this episode of Latinas, we'll celebrate the holiday season and all of the tradiciones that come with it, hear about colorism in Hollywood films, and so much more. Latinas starts now. Welcome to Latinas, the show that's all about nuestras mujeres in the Latinx community. I'm Tina Beth Pina. It's holiday time, and today I'm hosting the show from Salsa Vende, a restaurant in Yonkers, New York, that specializes in authentic Puerto Rican cuisine. Can you say delicioso? Something else that's also very delicious is the traditional rosca de reyes, a Mexican sweet bread that's enjoyed with family and friends on the Feast of the Epiphany or January 6th, El Día de los Reyes. Correspondent Anera Romero is about to share with us the history and secret behind this tasty treat. Don Paco Lopez Panaderia has been making rosca de reyes in Sunset Park, Brooklyn for 30 years. The family-owned business spans three generations and boasts a diverse clientele. Among its famous rosca customers include Thalia. A loyal customer come to the bakery to get the bread, get the tamales, get the rosca, el champurrado, arroz con leche, and they, they also have uh, the tortas. Eaten on El Dia de Reyes on January 6th, this sweet bread is made to look like a king's crown, decorated with dry figs and candied fruit jewels. Similar to the Mardi Gras king cake and other decorated breads from Catholic countries like France, Spain, and Mexico. Unlike those breads, the rosca has a special hidden treasure inside. This is a little plastic doll uh, we call baby Jesus. Why we hide baby Jesus? Because this is the end of Christmas season and it's to hide baby Jesus from the King Herodes. Although the celebration starts January 6th, it isn't over on that day. On February 2nd, El Dia de la Candelaria, or Candlemas, the ritual presentation of the baby Jesus takes place. The person who finds the baby Jesus figurine inside La Rosca the month before ends up hosting a party and serving tamales for family and friends. Everybody and nobody want to find baby Jesus. Everybody want to find baby Jesus because it's the joy. It's like the child that we have inside of us. And nobody want to find it because they have to throw a party. Don Paco Lopez Panaderia estimates making 300 roscas for the holiday celebration for their mostly Catholic clientele who celebrate El Dia de Reyes. Up to here in Brooklyn, we are still doing our own uh, dry candies to put in the top of the Rosca de Reyes. I think it's the difference between the rest of the bakeries in New York and Don Paco Lopez Panaderia, that we keep that tradition as a uh, artisan baker. I couldn't resist trying Rosca de Reyes for the very first time. For me, the best part is the cross. It's uh, something that, because it's Sugar, sweeter, no. Mm. I think I found it, uh -oh. it's in there. Looks like I'm gonna have to make a party. <laughs> <laughs> I have it. I found baby Jesus. For Latinas, I'm Elena Romero. Puerto Rican fashion designer, photographer, and stylist Franco La Costa has captivated audiences across America on shows like America's Next Top Model and The Bachelorette. He's about to share his thoughts on fashion, why it shouldn't have a gender, and how you must dress for yourself and not for trends. The moment that I felt that I was an artist. It was when I fell in love with faces, when I would go to the museums and look at the paintings, all the artwork from ancient times, the stories of all these incredible, gifted, talented people that all start with a blank page. 
Fashion and art have always been integrated into everything that I do. It is my source of inspiration. I came here, I studied art history in Pratt Institute in New York, did an internship with Gianfranco Ferre in Milan. I learned so much. I've always been asked if my clothing is genderless or not. So I really think that that openness this honesty that I grew up being by myself in Puerto Rico, in me and my world, and what was going on around me, I was able to create this internal dialogue. I just wanted to become more me and more me. You know, growing up the way I grew up with Latin countries, everything is very machista. Pink is for the girls, blue is for the boys. I really did not care much about that. I love color and I was always in a very you know, exploration mode, as I call it. I'm trying to mix my own colors and pigments. Finding my fingers dirty with color and putting things together and, and feel how to articulate. <laughs> I discovered that I was so connecting with my masculine side and my feminine side. It's a very present sort of energy. It allows me to have empathy for a woman the same way I can have empathy for a man. It's all of a sudden, it makes me just like this fluid human being. So then I've decided to make clothes that really fit, that have a tailor's look, but there's the feminine side to it. My clothes is universal, is, is transcendent, is really, I'm not looking, I'm not following trends. The Latinas are the luckiest women in the world. First of all, be proud, you know, have this sense of pride in your culture. Let's start there. We have lived in such a colonization for so long. So that has been poignant in how people are thinking today about themselves. You have to look in a certain way to be safe, to appeal to the other one. But all you have to come is from within your own culture and power. The power that is within you from your roots. Looking is one thing, being in is another way. Be so for sure, a Latina is Earth, is Mother Earth. Because we live in a world where everything is so visual, we have to make the effort to always look good. We have to be able to be honest with ourselves when it comes down to fashion. Not all trends look good on all bodies. I really think it's important to do the research and find out what looks good on people. Also, to be playful and to be fun. Fashion allows you to play, and fashion allows you to find yourself. The clothes that I have is not for people who are shy, and to be able to explore and to discover these incredible things about you. That's why to me fashion is so important. It's that time of year to look our very best, and celebrity hairstylist and makeup artist Millie Morales is here to give us some glam tips and tricks to look stunning this holiday season. A great idea and easy to achieve for this holiday season is a classic wing liner and bold lips. You will look great for date or night out. You wanna see? Let's start. You see how pretty the eyeliner is? For that I use Pro Long Wear Black Trap from MAC. A quick tip a la Mili is an angle brush. It will make that step much easier and also it help you for the precision. To give a little light to the inner corner of your eyes, you can use a highlighter. I'm using a touch of gold from Be Bella by Mili, so sassy. And I will put it right in the inner corner of my eye. Try this. It will take that eyeliner to the next level. When it comes down to bold lips for those special occasion, I always recommend long lasting lipstick and especially the lip stain because it will stay forever and ever until you take them out. I always looking for those uh, lip stain product that had the perfect applicator because it's going to be easier for me to apply on my lips. It's very soft, it's very rich in pigment. To help out the product to dry easily and evenly, you wanna take a tissue and you wanna take the excess. 
it's gonna help the product dry evenly. I love this color. But to take it out, you would need the Mysore Cleansing Water All-in-One Waterproof from Garnier. I love this one. It will take it out like that. And remember, and my first recommendation after you enjoyed that party, that event, uh, that night out with that beautiful makeup and easy to achieve is to take it out. Remember to take care of your skin, self, and soul. <laughs> Alicia Alonso was an inspiring and profound figure in ballet history. Born in Havana, Cuba, Alonso rose to prominence when she replaced the prima ballerina in the American Ballet Theater Company in the title role of Giselle. And the rest, as they say, is history. Alicia Alonso's trajectory in the world of ballet lasted more than 50 years with legendary performances in Swan Lake, Carmen, and so many more. Alonso is remembered for her artistry, longevity as a performer, and immense contribution to ballet in her native Cuba, but also for her battle with near blindness that never deterred her from continuing to dance. Miss Alonso stood out internationally for the great beauty of her performances and danced solos in Europe and elsewhere well into her 70s. Alonso died in Cuba in 2019 at the age of 98. Alicia Alonso, the charismatic ballerina of unusual range and power, and the pride of all Cubans is today's Badass Latina. This past summer, In the Heights premiered in theaters, and for all the advances in Latinx representation and visibility it made, many people felt that the film missed an opportunity to combat long-standing issues of colorism in the Latino community and Hollywood at large. With West Side Story already in theaters this month, Three Latinas tell us what they thought about In the Heights and what their hopes are for West Side Story and Latinos in film overall in today's Caliente Caliente. When you look at something like In the Heights and um, the fact that In the Heights is Little Dominican Republic yes. and there was really no representation of D Dominicans, so many of us are black. So to, have, to not have that was incredibly disappointing. One of the things that struck me about the film is that it's evidently not about uh, of the, in the Heights. You know, it's not about Washington Heights. Right. It is uh, a, an attempt to create some kind of what I call generic Latinidad. And what's interesting about that to our conversation is one, that the idea of Latino is still a light-skinned Latino and the second is, even when they had some Afro-Latino actors uh, in the main cast, Afro-Latino storylines were not present. They had some black um, actors, but they were in the background. So for me, that was offensive. And it was a missed opportunity for Lee Manuel. I'm very happy that he, you know, he apologized. I, I like him a lot, uh, and you know, but it, it was really a, a missed opportunity for us, uh, for, for the entire community. And it's been my position that uh, the generic Latino uh, model that was used in Hollywood in the 40s and you know, until now is no longer going to work. There is a much more empowered, diverse, and vocal Latino community today than there was 60 years ago. Mm -hmm. And people have the means to produce their own stories, uh, even in a small scale. Yes. And, and that's, and that's the, the thing that we as Latino, we need to understand that we have the power. We have the consumer power. And, and let me tell you, Hollywood is struggling. They are struggling because they don't know how to take that power and make money. So we have to do it. We have to do, we have to do our own content. We have to tell our stories. We have to do it ourselves. I totally agree with you, Marisol. I'm one of the artistic producers of the Dominican Artists Collective, and our, our primary goal is to do just that, you know, get together and really create that work that we want to see. Um, because, you know, you can't just wait around and, and hope that they're gonna get it right. Hope that the next movie or the next TV show or the next whatever it is, is not generic. Tonight, tonight for the West Side Story. I hope, I'm hoping 
that they, they are going to ha have better representation of uh, Afro, Afro uh, Latinos and Latinos in general. Uh, but there's always this little thing that in my heart just waiting for like, oh, maybe they're not. I'm, who knows? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm not hopeful <laughs> um, at all. Um, you know, I even think the original West Side Story was incredibly stereotypical of um, Latinos in general. But at the same time, I, I realize that it's it's a positive in terms of in terms of what we're asking, right? Um, the more Latino content gets made, the more um, the more visibility there is towards our community. I do expect it to be a, a liberal update of the narrative, so I, I you would perhaps assume that we'll have less stereotypical representation at a certain level. Mm -hmm. An Afro-Latina is playing Anita, so that's already different casting than in, the, in most prior versions of West Side Story in Broadway or in film. One of the paradoxes is that even when In the Heights or West Side Story will not be what we expect, it might make the careers of some people possible. What's great is that, you know, these movies are, are coming out, but the more Latino films that get made, the better the chances are that there will be more Afro-Latino representation. One of the traditions that we used to do back in, back in Peru is, um, for New Year's, uh, we gather like old stuff from the house and make, um, make um, this muñecos and we put them out at 12 and we clean them up. Para el 24 de diciembre, que es el día donde nace el niño Dios, entonces celebramos las eh, novenas eh, durante nueve días y el 24 eh, hacemos el cierre con el nacimiento del niño Dios, con natilla, con muñuelos. El 31 de diciembre todos tenemos el estreno, todos estrenamos pinta nueva, ropa nueva para recibir el año con la mejor energía. Eh, también cogemos lentejas y no las metemos al bolsillo para la prosperidad. La tradición en Navidad es comer carne puerco, eh, carne puerco, arroz, frijoles y yuca con mom. Pero lo más importante y simpático es que a las 12 de la noche uno se pasa un huevo, así haya un huevo nada más en la casa, uno se lo reparte ahí para limpiarse las malas energías y lo tira con la ventana para afuera, el balcón para afuera y es muy simpático porque a veces te madrean de una forma impresionante porque le tiras ese huevo, además con supuestamente tu mala energía, a cualquiera y le cae en la cabeza. The biggest celebration is New Year's Eve. You take a shower with herbs and try to clean the bad energies that have been there the whole year and then you just put on a very nice yellow panties on. So, feliz año y thank you for watching Latinas. As we try to celebrate the holidays safely with family and friends, we can't forget that COVID-19 is still affecting people's lives. Here's one woman's personal story. My name is Karina and I got lucky. My parents are from Ecuador and they decided that they were going to Ecuador early in January. So come the end of February, I'm begging them not to go. My parents live in the Upper West Side. COVID was still not declared an emergency or a pandemic. Of course, my parents fly away. My dad was 79 at the time. My mom was 77. And sure enough, three weeks into their trip, Ecuador actually shut down their airports. No one could come in, no one can go out. And people were literally dropping dead in the streets. My older brother calls me and tells me he's trying to bring them back. Uh, my father had what we thought was symptoms. I, I swore my parents were going to pass. I swore I would never see them again. I wouldn't get their bodies. That was the end of that. This was at the end of March. My parents were both infected. They got on an airplane, dropped off in Miami. From Miami, they got onto another plane to New York City. My mother says no one wore masks. I got lucky. My parents got better at home, but my parents survived. Now COVID has changed them. My father has a, a cough. 
he loses his balance now. My mom can hardly walk. She has a hard time breathing. COVID has some after effects that are coming up a year later. Just in time for the holidays, financial advisor Marie Angeles Bonine is here to share a few tips that will help our kids think about their values and teach them how to give back to society all year round. When talking about money, I think it is important that we also teach our children about giving back. We talked about helping our children create a budget, a budget for the money coming in and the money going out. And part of that money coming in could be organized in a category that's called giving back. And the giving back category can include three buckets. It can include core, the causes that they're most passionate about, it can include community, for example, donating money to the school, and it can include relief, helping with a specific relief effort of something that's just happened. Why is it important that we help our children organize that giving back category? As our children grow, and they think through the values and they think through the causes that they'd like to contribute to, they tend to get really, really, really excited about them. And if they don't stick to their budget, they can use all of the money coming in to fund that cost. And whether you're using your wallet, you're using your time, you're using your skills, or you're using your voice, we all can make a difference. Have you ever wondered what goes on behind the scenes when kids are watching Sesame Street or Shaun the Sheep? Award-winning animator Alba Garcia Riva sat down with Judas Escalona to talk about stop animation, live puppetry, and bringing some Latin sabor to the industry. And that's why she's today's Latina on the Rise. According to Zipia.com, which tracks career demographics, nearly 12% of animation artists were Latino in 2018. By gender, men making the greatest percentage at 70%, women at 23%. Alba Garcia is among them. Already an exhibiting artist at age 12, she became fascinated with animation, and when she was old enough, moved to the States from Puerto Rico to study. At that time, Computer animation wasn't, it was the, the thing to learn. So I decided, let me, I have to leave the island because there's no computer animation every, any, any, in any place in the schools and the universities. So I, I came to New York to the School of Visual Arts and then I, that's where I learned animation. And that's where I found out that most of the films that I loved when I was a kid, that they were done in stop motion. But what exactly is stop motion animation? In a second, you have 24 frames. So 24 pictures of a puppet moving. One picture, 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 one picture. Like 24 pictures is one second. Usually you have about three to four seconds in a take. That will take you a whole day. For making even one second, it will take an hour or two. <laughs> That hard work paid off when MTV's Celebrity Deathmatch hired her as an animator. Then Heather Henson of the Jim Henson Company, the makers of The Muppets, proposed that she do a project on Tainos, the indigenous people of Puerto Rico and other Caribbean islands. Do you want to make a film about uh, the, the Taino culture, your Taino? And I, at that moment when she said that, I was like, am I? I didn't understand why she saw me as Taino. So who am I? And I continued the research and that's how I wrote that film because I, I started to understand where I came from. Garcia met with the Taino community and developed a story titled Doc Toca Taino, in English, I am Taino, about a Puerto Rican abuela who teaches her granddaughter about her Taino roots. There was one catch though. Henson wanted Garcia to make them live puppets, like the Muppets. You know that I do not, I have never done live puppetry because my puppets are this big for stop motion. That Abuela Yaya is life size with a whole set of animatronics in the head. Abuela's bare skull looked like this. 
Animatronics is a field in itself where any type of creature, human or animal, can be designed and given movements that combine the most sophisticated mechanics and electronics with a software interface that can be operated remotely. Garcia also directed a team that included Latino puppeteers. The result? Dr. Cataino won Best Animation Short in the 2019 Red Nation International Film Festival. That day I felt like a million dollars because um, that was, you know, when, when the, your people recognizes your work, that is so important. And this is for everybody that is indigenous from whatever, Taino, Navajo, Cheyenne. Alba Garcia is now completing a new stop motion animation called Dangerously Ever After, 10 years in the making. I'm Judith Escalona for Latinas. And that's our show for today. For more information on what you just saw, check out our website at tv.cuny.edu and follow our social media profiles. We love sharing our Latina stories with you. And please make sure you tune in next month. We'll ring in the new year with some nutrition tips from Esmeralda Gallimore, meet Pepita Sandwich, and so much more. Feliz Navidad y Prospero Año Nuevo. Y uepa! Hasta la próxima. Bye-bye.